So what is the very best thing we can do for those who are disfellowshipped? We already read it in 1 Corinthians 5.11. Stop keeping company with them, not even eating with them. And speaking of the same sort of person, the Apostle John wrote it, 2 John 10, Do not receive him into your homes or say a greeting to him. Some of Jehovah's people may think this is too drastic and that their keeping in contact with the disfellowship friend or relative is a kindness. But they could not be more wrong about that. You see, it may salve their own feelings, but they would be doing the worst possible thing for the disfellowship person. Where would some of Jehovah's people get the idea that this is too drastic? That keeping in contact with a disfellowshipped friend or relative is a kindness? It couldn't possibly be their Bible-trained conscience, could it? Throughout the Bible record, we find Jehovah appealing to sinners to repent. He urges those who had strayed from true worship to return. This is in harmony with Romans 2, verse 4, which says, Or do you despise the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, because you do not know that God, in his kindness, is trying to lead you to repentance? Consider some examples in which we see Jehovah trying to lead sinners to repentance. Cain showed murderous hatred for his brother Abel, but Jehovah reached out to Cain and tried to reason with him. When David sinned, Jehovah used the prophet Nathan to lead David to repentance. And what about the nation of Israel? Jehovah kept appealing to them, even when they showed no desire to repent. At Ezekiel 33:11, Jehovah appeals to the nation of Israel, as surely as I am alive, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that someone wicked changes his way and keeps living. Turn back, turn back from your bad ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? What does this teach us? That while Jehovah doesn't force anyone to repent of his sins, he has demonstrated great compassion for imperfect humans. He's gone to great lengths to make forgiveness possible, to appeal to sinners, and to lead them to repentance, if at all possible. What a compassionate and merciful God we worship. So, do you mean to say that witnesses could not grasp and be moved by these examples of Jehovah showing mercy to wrongdoers from reading the Bible? that their consciences could not possibly be trained by reading these scriptures, thus moving them to imitate God? In keeping with the scriptural admonition, at 1 Corinthians 5.11, when a person has been removed from the congregation, we stop keeping company with that person, not even eating with such a man. That means we don't socialize with those who are removed from the congregation. However, that does not mean that a Christian could not invite a disfellowship person to attend a congregation meeting. That disfellowship person could be a relative, a former Bible student, or someone we were close to in the past. What if a disfellowship person comes to a congregation meeting? Under our current arrangement, we don't say a greeting to individuals who've been removed from the congregation. However, the governing body has decided that publishers can use their Bible-trained conscience to decide whether to give a simple greeting and welcome a disfellowshipped individual who attends a congregation meeting. Hi, so good to see you here. Thank you. While we wouldn't have an extended conversation or socialize with such a person, we do not need to ignore him completely. Dear Jehovah's Witnesses, Isn't it obvious by now that your conscience is not Bible trained? In order to remain in the organization, you must convince yourself of at least three things. 
that you cannot understand the Bible on your own without the help of the governing body. That, for the sake of unity, what God wants is for you to be obedient to men instead of what He says in His Word. That if, as a result of reading the Bible, you ever arrive at an understanding that differs from what the governing body has said, you must immediately dismiss it. So, regarding the men that claim to have the authority to tell you when and when not to obey your conscience, you need to ask yourself a very important question. It comes down to this, friends. Do I really believe that Jehovah is directing this organization today?